Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blowed his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touched air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, we offer member shows for members only on the website and the app. That comes out every Thursday. And with that membership, you also get the Tuesday shows ad-free and access to any overtime conversation available available right there on the website and the app. So if that interests you, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com today and hit the join button to become a member. Also, with everything going on in the world, make sure you're prepared. Go to preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com and get yourself emergency supply food. Prices are going up on the store shelves, friends. Get your stock supply now so that you are not running bare on the shelves in your house when the store shelves are bare. And we did drop the documentary Expedition Dogman for the VIPs to Merkel.media. That's www.merkel.media. The documentary is available there to the VIPs only. If you want to have the early screening, it is available on replay right now at Merkel.media. So if you are interested in seeing that now and you don't want to wait for the public release, head on over to www.merkel.media and become a VIP to see the Expedition Dogman documentary VIP release. And before we get to this week's episode and our guest, I want to give a quick shout out to the Freaky Deaky podcast. I want to point my listeners in the direction of that podcast. Please go ahead and check it out. Freaky Deaky podcast with Scott Walker and friends. They do a great job over there and I want you guys to go and check them out. So check out the Freaky Deaky podcast. Give them a subscribe, a five-star rating or review, and then hit play. All right, this week we have Justin coming on the show and Justin runs the YouTube channel Mountain Beast Mysteries. He has a lot of things that he is doing. He goes out on his own expeditions. He goes with people. He goes by himself and he puts it all on his YouTube channel of over 115,000 subscribers. Him and I have a real honest conversation, some of his experiences and how we feel about the topic of Bigfoot, the Bigfoot community and everything in between. So let's get to Justin right now. All right, today we got a great guest coming on, uh, Justin. Justin, now listen, uh, I, before we go any further, I, I'm going to try my best here, okay? Uh, Justin Chernipsky. You failed. Dang it! Dang it! <laughs> I, I was, listen I, listen, I knew this interview was coming up and stuff, and every time I thought about it, I was like, okay, I can, I can do this, I can do this. How do you pronounce your last name, man? It's Chernipsky. Dang if it, you I was slow bad. it, if, 
if you slow it down and you sound out all the letters, it makes sense. You have no idea what it was like as a child going through a school and getting called on the <laughs> intercom every time. It was just an absolute disaster. Yeah. Well, I mean, before I was adopted, uh, my last name was Frickert. So every time I got called over the intercom for you know punching a kid in the face, it was Anthony Frickert, please report to the uh, principal's office, you know. And so I, it, it was kind of a weird last name. And uh, one of my video guys for my documentary crew, his last name is Heine. So imagine the the uh, wow. yeah, imagine the teasing he got growing up and stuff. Shout out to Ward. So <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That's a that one sucks. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> at least at least nobody mispronounces it. It's <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Justin, man, uh, you listen, I think you and I connected years ago, man. And we we never really talked a whole lot, but, uh, I just remember, and I don't remember where or how we connected. I just remember having interaction with you a long time ago. Like when I first started podcasting, I think you had just started your YouTube channel. Uh, well, I think it was like, I remember when I started doing the Bigfoot YouTube channel, it was right around the same time you were doing the Pennsylvania Bigfoot stuff on YouTube as well. Yeah. And so it was probably somewhere in that area where we connected online. That makes sense, actually. I totally forgot about that channel. Thanks for reminding yeah. me about bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for bringing it up. If anybody's wondering, that is uh, no longer in existence. It's, uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it was, was good. Well, you know, it, uh, no, it wasn't. So <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, I, I had, as far as quality goes, it sucked. I, I had no concept of that. It wasn't, I really wasn't even doing it for that. I just, I was into this Bigfoot stuff and I had the Facebook group, which was the Pennsylvania Sasquatch Research. And I figured let's start a YouTube channel where I share my thoughts. And I'm like turning my phone sideways, recording in a running tractor trailer with the diesel motor running in the background. I'm like, this is great, right? And I'm like, why isn't the channel not growing? So <laughs> yeah, well, it was interesting back then because on YouTube, this was like around 2016. There wasn't a lot of channels on Bigfoot yeah. on YouTube, but nowadays there's so many. So I kind of feel like back then was like the time to to start. If you would have stuck with it, man. Hey, man, I, I'm, I'm not doing too bad right now. So <laughs> no, you look like you're doing pretty good. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm doing just fine. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm fully invested in podcasting. And I, I am I have the YouTube channel and I'm just doing it differently now. And it's on a higher level. Uh, and then there's the documentaries and stuff. I'm doing a bunch of stuff. So uh, I'm having fun. But uh, your YouTube channel is Mountain Beast Mysteries. Was it always that called that? Yes. I okay. Think so. So when did you start this channel and and why? Like, I mean, was it always focused on Bigfoot and how you wanted to kind of... what? Because I, I vaguely remember when we were talking years ago, uh, you, you didn't have a Bigfoot encounter and you were just kind of on the search for it. Is that how it was working? Were you a skeptic? What? I, I was very, very interested in the topic. Back then, like, I, I would say nowadays I'm more skeptical than ever before. Okay back then I was just like, Oh yeah, it's gotta be out there. Like I, this stuff is so cool. I definitely believe it. And I didn't really like, I don't know. I was just younger and and stupid. So, um, it kind of started, I remember one day I was at work in 2013, I was working at the Royal Tyrrell museum of paleontology, which is like one of the world's biggest dinosaur museums ever. And, uh, one of the guys I was working with was like, man, wouldn't it be cool to just like do something crazy and, and make a documentary about something stupid like Bigfoot or something like that. And I was, I thought about it and I was like, you know what? It really would be cool to do that because that guy didn't know that a little while before my dad had actually told me that he had this weird experience on Vancouver Island where he swore that a Bigfoot creature was throwing rocks at him and his friend while they were fishing at this lake. And so that was in the back of my mind. And when my friend at work said like, Oh, it'd be cool to make a Bigfoot documentary. I was like, yeah, uh, it really would. And then like immediately, like after that, I went home and I started like looking at camera equipment online. I'm like, I, I should try to do this. And that's kind of how it started with the idea of making one documentary film, which became wild man, my search for Sasquatch. That was the first thing I, I made on the subject. And I had no intentions of doing YouTube or putting it on YouTube at all. My idea was I was going to make it and then just self-distribute it on like Vimeo and whatever else was available at the time, like Amazon and just make a bunch of money. And that was going to be it. I was going to move on to like 
a different topic for my next film. I was interested in doing filmmaking. I just didn't know what I was going to do. And then when the idea of Bigfoot came along, that's kind of what I rolled with. So when I eventually released that film after like three years or so, it just didn't perform at all. So I'm like, oh crap, like I spent all this money making this documentary and it hasn't like made any money. I might as well just throw it on YouTube and maybe it'll like turn into something. Maybe I'll, I'll be able to grow a YouTube channel. And it turned out that was, you know, exactly what was supposed to happen. So, yeah. So, uh, I think you grossly underestimated the marketing aspect of how YouTube can help you <laughs> help you out. Definitely. So this was what? So you said three years later. So like in 2016 is when you when you were ready to put the the video out. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, 2016. It, it was uh, that that's right around the time that the the door was really swinging in YouTube's uh, favor when it comes to just organic growth of any kind of content if you wanted to put it out there. I mean, it was happening before stuff, so, but it kind of really hit that 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 groove. And then you know things started happening over YouTube, and you know things kind of went downhill depending on how you look at it. So um, the the idea of going on Vimeo though, that was that's an interesting one for me because I never would have thought that Vimeo would be a, a landing spot for somebody putting out their first you know piece of content. Did you think it was going to organically grow from that or were you planning on word of mouth and using the Vimeo as the the source? I honestly had no idea what I was doing. Gotcha. I just, I knew a guy could put a video on Vimeo and sell it. Right. And then I knew I could get some stuff on Amazon prime just through like myself. I didn't have to go through anybody really. I just had to submit it. Um, yeah, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. So it was all just a guessing game at that point. Did you, uh, when it comes to the film and everything, I mean, was this something that you just was like, I I'm going to do it, so I'm going to buy some equipment and figure it out? It, or did you actually, you know, kind of grow up with cameras and wanting to do this kind of stuff? Um, okay, I knew I wanted to make films since I was like seven years old and saw some behind the scenes footage of Star Wars. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. That's when I knew I wanted to, to do video and work with cameras. But I didn't actually get any any formal training until I was in college. I was in college for like outdoor adventure and uh, like guiding. So I was learning how to be a, an outdoor guide. And uh, part of that schooling was photography. And I think I did a semester, maybe two semesters of photography. And that's where I really got to like understand how a camera works. But even then it was just like a photo camera. Didn't really know much about video. And back then when I was in college, it was it was just as like these DSLR cameras were getting the the capabilities of shooting video. So all of a sudden, like at that time, like the technology was becoming accessible to me. I could make like high quality videos. And uh, once I went through college and took the photography course and got a good camera, I started really like thinking about doing something serious. I remember when I was in college. Uh, Lindsay and I had a photography class. My wife, Lindsay, uh, we had a photography class together and I was there because I had to be there. Like it was some kind of like elective I needed to take. And uh, it was it was cool. Like I was like, OK, we're taking pictures. And and it, like you were saying, I mean, the the photography was great. You could take some video. I don't know what, what year were, are you, roughly are you talking about? I'm talking like more like 2005, 2006 is when I'm uh, the time frame that I'm looking like at. 2010, 2011. OK, Uh and I, uh, thanks for making me feel old, by the way. Uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, I remember taking those classes and stuff and I was there because I had to be, be there and I, I learned some stuff, but I just kind of like, after I was done, I was like, never going to need to do that again. And then here, <laughs> here I am, uh, doing all the stuff that I do. And I, I really wish I would have taken that, <laughs> those classes, maybe more of those classes and took it more serious. I just, I never could have imagined me doing this, what I do now and stuff. I was like, you know, I, 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 I had in my deepest of hearts, I knew I wasn't even going to graduate from college. And I was like, I'm going to wind up being a truck driver. And, <laughs> and so what do I need this for? And, uh, you know, you, you live with some, some regret. It's crazy how things have turned out in the world and how much video has kind of taken over everybody's lives. Every day people go on YouTube and Every watch day. videos. It's crazy. 
It really is. And, and that's something that I've been fighting for years, podcasting. Uh, I did not want to do YouTube like video as far as like to doing the interviews on video and then putting it on YouTube. Because as somebody who does that stuff, you know, it takes forever to edit video and then export it from your files and up, upload it to YouTube, then have them do their processing and then go through the whole thing of monetization, placing all that stuff. is just, it's, it's so annoying to me. I didn't want to touch <laughs> it. And, uh, and then it really, it came down to my brother, Jack, he was just hounding me about it. He's like, Tony, you got to start doing your interviews on video. He's hounding me and my dad about it for our other podcast. And it's like, I don't want to, you know, and eventually I started doing it and uh, the channel has been growing. I'm like, oh, this actually works. Okay. You know, because people like, I'm like, it's a podcast. I've been doing podcasting for five years. Why do I need to do it on video? And he's like, because you'll expose yourself to a lot more people. I'm just like, how? <laughs> it turns out he's yeah. right. So <laughs> you don't want to be, you don't want to be left behind. Exactly. As far as technology goes, it's really easy to get left behind nowadays. If you can't 100. keep up, then you're kind of screwed. Exactly. That That's exactly how I feel. Uh, and I feel like I finally am getting on it and stuff. And I don't think I'm too late to it. I, I think I did come in just in the right time because I, I, I do feel like it could have uh, gone the opposite direction if I waited too long doing video and stuff. But, um, it, it, you know, I, I, I can see it. I mean, the, the final product is, is a lot better when you can actually watch somebody doing the podcast versus just listening. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, anyways, uh, let's talk about something you said earlier. OK, uh, we, we talked about the cameras. We talked about all the, the, the nerding out on technology and stuff, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and we could probably do a whole just conversation on that stuff. But uh, you, you said that you're more of a skeptic today than you were back then. Uh, why? How? What was that progression for you? Because uh, I mean, you have a channel where you put out video content on this topic. Uh, is it more of like, do you do you not believe in Bigfoot, or did you ever believe in Bigfoot, or is it something that you're just more qu questioning now than ever? No, I, I should clarify that. I am definitely leaning towards Bigfoot being real. Like, I'm pretty sure it's real. Like, what else could? be i guess spawning all these stories and, and, and like encounters that you come across like there's thousands thousands of them what i'm skeptical of i guess is the majority of stuff you see online nowadays that people call evidence right there's so many pictures video clips and, and all kinds of crap floating around online i i, I really think like probably 95 percent of the stuff you see is either like a hoax or misidentifications or you know something along those lines i think genuine real bigfoot evidence is extremely rare and and hard to come across i think it's in very it's out there but in a very small quantity and uh that's i guess what i'm skeptical of is most of the stuff that people bring forward online because a guy can just a guy can make up a story in an afternoon and post it online and then it gets shared around by thousands of people and it's like how do you vet that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that vetting, uh, you can, as the person receiving a story, whether it's you, me, or the audience, it can only go so far. Uh, somebody says that this happened at this time, this location, and there, until we have a time machine, it's hard to 100% vet people. I'm not an investigator. I'm a collector of stories. Um, but I do understand what you're saying because... Uh, I think that sometimes people uh, have a radical encounter, and uh, and you see this a lot online. Uh, I, I think I, I, I've I've seen it mostly on Facebook. I don't hang on Facebook a whole lot anymore, but I remember seeing a lot of it on Facebook where there's people that I believe had an experience, and it turns them into. Uh, a, a radical for the topic, which is fine as far as, you know, trying to like understand more, learn more and stuff. But I do think that sometimes it plays mind games with people and they start seeing it places that if they didn't have the experience and they didn't know what they saw the first time, almost they look at what they're putting out there now and be like, uh, eh, I don't know. You know what I mean? But I think in, in, in their mind, it's just like, I don't know. Like it, it's, it, it just seems like something clicks in their head and it's just like, you know, that they're so hungry for that next encounter that they might tend to see it more than what really is going on around them. Yeah, it is really hard to kind of like put your beliefs and desires kind of on hold when when looking at stuff like evidence, right? 
like you see all this stuff online, but then you have all your personal beliefs and, and what you want it to be like kind of it's like a filter you're seeing yeah. all the stuff through it just makes it really hard to get a clear image of what is actually going on so i don't know and then the whole community online is just completely divided <laughs> so you don't even know what to believe you don't even know what bigfoot is what, i don't know what community <laughs> yeah well we i got, guess we got we got to figure out a better word for it because last time i There's, checked and stuff it wasn't much unity in the, the the community you know yeah it's more like a war zone Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things where I, I just kind of, I, I stepped back from it years ago. I, back, basically when I started the podcasting and stuff, I kind of stepped away from whatever you want to call that as a community, uh, because, you know, I, I, I had to take a different approach from everybody else out there. You know, uh, I, I'm not, I don't conduct my show to tell people what things are, what they've seen, what they didn't see. I collect people's stories and I share them with other people and let the people receiving the stories make up their own minds. And uh, because of that, I don't really... Uh, back then, I made a conscious decision to not engage in one side or the other. Uh, and as time's gone on, the more I've got comfortable with that, because the more I realize I don't really know what these things are and how they operate. Uh, I have my own thoughts and opinions and theories, but to stand on one side of the line and say, this is what I think it is, therefore it is... No, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not comfortable doing that. What do you think? I mean, as far as uh, that kind of stuff goes and stuff and, and being a content creator in this field, do you feel like um, you have, uh, I think everybody should have a firm understanding as to what they feel or what they lean towards. Uh, but are you easily swayed on that? Or are you open to conversation and, and debate? Or are you pretty much set in stone on what you feel? I, I'm not set in stone. Like I, I'm open to every theory and every idea because I genuinely don't know what Bigfoot is. Like there, there's so many different things that it could be. And it, it would be like, I would be a real a-hole, you know, if I acted like I knew exactly what this mystery was, it's, it's silly for anybody to act that way to me. Like you will come across people that will say, this is for sure that, and you know, they'll be so firm on, on what they're saying. It's like, but you don't really know. You yeah. don't really know what you're talking about. So like Mountain Beast Mysteries was always a place where I would just present the encounters and stories and showcase my journeys out into the wilderness. And then people can take that, you know, and, and do what they want with it. You know, they can make up their own theories and ideas, but it's, it's, I, I generally, generally don't say for certain what this is or what that is, you know? Yeah. Uh, we're just going out into the woods we're exploring and um hopefully you know one day we'll come across something and then you know if i get something on video one day it'll get tossed around online and people will rip it to shreds and then i'll quietly pull out of the bigfoot community and disappear forever yeah there you go there you go i mean uh, see you already know what's going to happen that's that's the, that's the sad part about it is that you know that if you come up across with some legit solid evidence, great cameras, whatever, steady, you're on a tripod, you know, it doesn't know you're there, you're 20 feet away from it, whatever, or whatever that is, and your your meters crap. Uh, so like I I I know as well as you know that you're gonna pass that around the internet and there's gonna be people debunking it. There's gonna be YouTube channels that are dedicated to debunking things, to taking it and picking it apart and telling their audience exactly why it's a false, it's it's a hoax. Uh, it, there's there's no way around it. It, it, yeah. it. In that sense, why do you continue doing what you do if you know it's gonna end that way? I don't really I, I've kind of come to come to terms with how it's gonna end. Like obviously, just doing YouTube in general, you get ripped apart on a daily basis. So you get really used to that. Yeah, And so I just imagine it's going to be like that, but worse and whatever. I can live with that. Um, but people always ask like, like, what do you do if you get it on video? What are you going to do? How should you go about releasing it? And I'm just like, I just put it out there and just take yeah. it. You just got to take it. Yes. And I, I like, like, I like going out into the woods and filming stuff. So that's why I keep doing it. I'm genuinely interested in the topic. And I'm really like, I live close to these areas where, you know, everyone says Bigfoot is supposed to be. So it's like, I'm, I'm going to be going camping there anyways for, for my own enjoyment. I might as well be doing this because I can combine all these different things that I love, like 
being an outdoorsman, searching for Bigfoot and filmmaking, I can combine them all into one thing. And it's just been perfect in that sense. So that's why I keep doing it. Yeah. And that, that's a great answer because I mean, if you don't love doing what you're doing, then there's no point in doing it. And when it comes to going around outside with the topic of Bigfoot on the mind, if you don't, uh, I said this years ago, I've always told people this, if you don't like being out in the woods, you're going to get bored fast and it's not going to last long. You know, like you have mm -hmm. to enjoy being out there. Uh, and a lot of times people are already doing it and that's how they have such longevity with that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, it, it's, it's just a shame that you, you have to view things that way in the sense that you know where that's where it's going to go uh and and i agree with you if if i come up with evidence and stuff i'm not going to you know sit around with a a think tank for six months all right how are we going to release this it's just like all right let's produce it make it look pretty and ship it out to the people and uh get ready to put your hard hats on guys because it's <laughs> it's going to be raining rocks like bigfoot's throwing them you know it's just like uh it it's going to happen and and that's the thing with with just the modern technology. There's so like I have a I have a friend in L.A. who does um, art uh, movie posters and stuff like that for like Disney, Netflix. Um, he's independent. They come to him when he when they need him to do something. He's an extremely good artist, and he always told me that like I would be the perfect person to recreate what I saw because I can literally do that. Uh, and, and he kind of refrains from doing a whole lot of the Bigfoot stuff as far as artwork goes, because he doesn't like, he's had, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It, it, it did go viral. It's a picture of a spider coming down in like the right in the jungle with a skull as a body. Uh, it, it, people are like, holy crap. Like, what is this and stuff? Like the, the people are believing it. He, 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 he designed that. Like, it's just like, it's, it's fake. It, I just made yeah. an awesome art piece that looks really real, you know? And so, um, if he can do that just with his hand and a computer, not using CGI and, and all that stuff and video effects. I mean, the, the, the ability, the, the opportunity is endless with trying to create something that's authentic and real looking, even though it's not. And so on the flip side of things, if you're, creating something and you actually catch it it's just people are going to say it's fake and that sucks it really sucks yeah you really have to i guess have all your bases covered like i'm what what i like about what i've done is that throughout the years of having the youtube channel i've kind of built up a reputation of just being like an honest guy you know yeah. like i just i film what happens and put it out there i don't say it's this or that I, I don't make any claims and I don't really amp anything up. And so having like a history of just being an honest, good person is great. It kind of helps you out to a degree. But then again, when it comes down to actually filming Bigfoot, you have to cover all your bases in the sense that you have to film this thing for a long time. You have to at least make an attempt to go after it. That's what you're there for. Right. And you have to look for, other evidences that are around in the area like footprints and whatnot and your your video clip if it's you know 30 seconds long it's not going to do you any good and that is 95 percent of what we see on the internet is 30 second clips blurry photographs and um tall tales you know you, you really have to go after it if you do see something you actually like physically have to go after it and and start filming the whole thing like if if somebody had a, a video of bigfoot and it turned into like a two hour long clip or, or whatever it doesn't have to be that long but like actually showing like approaching this thing and going after it and filming its tracks and all the trace evidence is left behind like that is that would be perfect right but we we haven't seen anything like that you're absolutely right and is that the kind of like a goal of yours Yes. <laughs> it's awesome. a very unreasonable goal. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not though. It's not. It, and I have the same goals, man. When I go out there, when I've been going out there now and stuff with my guys, like we, same goal. It, it, and, and people are like, well, what if you see something like that's the point? Like, like I've spent five years collecting people's stories of these legendary experiences. And now we're going out and looking for it ourselves. And if we find it, we're not trying to just film a quick snap of it. Like we're going to pursue. And that's what, that's what we did in Kentucky. And uh, we're going to continue to do that until we either find something, we get too old, or 
we die, I guess. I don't know. I mean, it's just one of those things where I think a lot of people don't really have that gear in them. And, uh, and, and it's fortunate that you have that gear and you have the, the actual gear to do what you, what you got to do, you know? Um, and so that it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, that kind of mindset. And I, I just find it funny that people don't all have that mindset. It's like, what, what yeah. if, what if something comes up? Come, what if, what if you're out there and you find something? It's like, it's, it, it kind of goes against like what you're programmed to do. Like you actually, it sounds kind of silly to say, but you kind of have to train yourself mentally to be able to like move forward um, when you run into one of these things. Cause like naturally what you want to do is just shut everything down and maybe just be quiet and sit there for a while or just take off and get out of there. Yeah. Like that's what your body and your mind wants to do. So it actually takes a little bit of practice to, um, be able to like go into your head and say like, okay, no, like I have to keep going. We have to follow this thing. Um, I really don't want to do it, but that's why I came out here all this way. And, uh, you know, after years of like going out into the wilderness, it kind of gets easier to, to have that mindset. So I, I'll tell I you, know, whenever I hear a weird noise, I like try and go after it or, or see what it was. I don't just shut down and cry in my sleeping bag, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so natural. Okay, let's talk about our sponsor for today, which is HelloFresh. We've been talking about HelloFresh for quite some time. And to be honest with you, now is the best time that you could possibly take advantage of HelloFresh. And I'm very proud to announce that they are a sponsor of the show. They are America's number one meal kit. But much more than that, you are in a time and era where store shelves are bare. And not only store shelves being bare, but you go into a restaurant and you order your favorite meal. And a lot of times they're saying right now, we don't have that. Why? Because it's hard to find the supplies. It's hard to get the supplies. The supplies are super expensive. There's a lot of things going into the shortages we're experiencing. But if you want to make sure that you're not going to be short on the HelloFresh side, just go ahead to their website, go ahead to the app and order the meals that you want to have delivered right to your house. Because if they're offering it on the website, they got it. HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality. So not only are the restaurants not able to offer the things that they say they want to offer, but HelloFresh is actually cheaper than your favorite dish at the restaurant anyways, and it's better. It ta- I promise you, it tastes better. I absolutely love HelloFresh, and you're going to save money at the grocery store. They're talking about the people in America. I don't know about globally, but in America with inflation, they're talking about the average household is going to spend around $1,000 more this year on their groceries. Well, with HelloFresh, you're going to save about $65 on average by using HelloFresh. They offer 50 minutes menu market items to choose from on their website. If they got it on the website, they got it in real life and they can ship it to you. And right now go to hellofresh.com slash confessional 16 and use code confessional 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. They're still giving stuff away, friends. Go to hellofresh.com slash confessional 16 and use code confessional 16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. I don't know what else to tell you. They're giving you 16 free meals and they're giving you three free gifts. It it doesn't get any better than that. Go to hellofresh.com slash confessional 16 right now and get those deals coming to your house, to your doorstep. Cut the grocery stores, cut the middleman and go right to HelloFresh. All right. So on that note, if what 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 are some things that have happened out there for you that kind of really perked your ears up and stuff? I mean, has have you had any experiences that you're just like scratching your head and like that was really weird and I don't know how to explain it? Um, last I want to say last spring, but it was the spring before that. Um, I was out hiking in the Nordic area here in Alberta, like super famous for having Bigfoot activity. You know, if you go on like the internet and search Nordeg Bigfoot, you'll find so much content on Bigfoot because it's the spot. It's like one of the hot spots of the world. But anyways, I was out hiking in the area. I'm walking on like a well-used trail and this is very early season. So not a lot of people have been in and out of there, uh, but I found something that looked like a track. It looked like a large humanoid track and it was pressed into the, into the soil, probably about half an inch or so. And, uh, it was weird. It was big. And there was only one of them. 
So I'm like, I can't really say that this is Bigfoot. Like, this is just, I'm just going to record it, document it, take pictures, you know, and just put it on the shelf. And then I continue on down the trail and um, maybe about an hour or so walking down the trail, I hear a really loud rock clack, like a rock clacking sound. And so instantly my heart is racing because I just saw this thing that looked like a track. And so I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be a Bigfoot and he's in this direction. Like I know where the sound came from. And that was like one of the moments where I'm like, I have to have the camera rolling and I got to be sneaking through the bushes to, to film this thing. Cause it's got to be there. I'm like, what else makes a rock clacking sound like this? Um, because sometimes it'll be out in the woods and the terrain, there's a lot of steep terrain and sometimes rocks will fall and pebbles will like roll down slopes and I'll make a very distinct noise, but to just hear one rock clack and that was it, it was just kind of peculiar to me. So I'm like something intelligent did that. And I'm like making up scenarios in my head. Like that's the other thing you have to contend with is like your, your subconscious is like spinning things in all directions. Right. So I, I sneak through these bushes and these trees and I'm filming and I get to where I think the sound was and there's just like nothing there. So I was like, what is going on? And so that was like a time where I was just like kind of confused and I didn't really see anything, but I'm like, I swear to God, like <laughs> something weird is going on, but it could have just been nothing. There was another time a few years ago, a guy uh, not too far away from where I live, he he called me saying that he has these Sasquatch creatures on his property. And um, I, I made a film about it. It's called The Supernatural Sasquatch. So you can, you can watch that. Um, but this guy was saying like for like multiple nights, these creatures were like harassing him and they were throwing stuff at his house. He lived on an acreage, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, okay, like he calls me out like, 11 p.m at night and it's like dark out it's in the dead of winter it's like january and he's like yeah these things are here right now you gotta come check this out i'm like oh my god like this is it like i'm gonna see it right now let's go <laughs> yeah so i like packed up all my crap like grabbed a shotgun like threw it in my car and like off i go it was only like half an hour out of the city that i live in which was crazy to me didn't make any sense um I get there at like just after midnight and uh, this guy's standing in his driveway with his dog and I get out of my car. He's like telling me to be quiet. He's like, Shh. he's like, they're over in the bushes, like watching us. And I like, at that point I didn't see or hear anything. I'm just listening to this guy wondering if he's crazy or not, because I never met this guy in my life before. I, I drove out at midnight to some stranger's farm. Like this guy could kill me. Right. Yeah. So that was another weird thing I was contending with, but, um, I, I ended up sticking around there. We went into the guy's house and he started telling me everything that was going on. And like all around his house, there was like pine cones that were all pinched off in the same spot. Um, that were, I guess, thrown at his house. There were like so many of them. Um, there were footprints through the snow, like across his yard that looked like Bigfoot footprints and like, they came from somewhere. You could actually follow them for quite a ways. It wasn't just a track or two. It was like a whole trackway, which was very, very interesting. I had never seen anything like that before. Um, and, and there were times where we would just be like standing in the yard and we weren't saying anything. We were just listening and you could swear that you would hear something creeping along in the trees in the darkness. You couldn't see it, but you swore that you could like hear something. And then, uh, I was about to pack up and leave. And uh, the guy was like, hey, maybe we should just go and like measure one of those tracks with the tape measure and just to see how long it was and document it. And I was like, like, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Like, I didn't even think of that. Like, I'm supposed to be researching and I'm so like in my head that I don't even think to do that. So right before I left, we went and did that. I put my camcorder. I had this big uh, Canon, like mini DV camcorder. I put it in my car. So all I had on me was my phone in case anything happened. Like I was screwed, right? Like I didn't have my equipment. We go in and we're filming this track and all of a sudden we hear something run through the bushes towards us. Like oh my it, it sounded absolutely massive. And this is just behind this guy's house. Like right behind his house, there was like a, a really steep slope and like a ravine. And down there, there was like a creek. 
And it sounded like this thing was like running up this slope, like in, in the bushes and trees. And, and then it just stopped. It probably ran for like six or seven steps and just stopped. And we are like crapping our pants, man. I looked at this guy, this other guy, and I could see him like physically shaking. He was so scared. And I'm like, oh my God, dude, we're going to see it for sure. Like this could be it. Like we might actually die. <laughs> so that's what I was thinking. And, and I, at that point I had turned my, my phone on to record. And then all you hear, like after we like paused and listened, I'm like, I yelled out to it. I'm like, hello. And then you hear the sound of a horse. What? Yeah. So I'm like, this doesn't make absolutely any sense. No. And I had like peered over the ravine and like looked around and there was nothing, there was nothing there. There was no animals of any kind. So I'm like, if this whole time, this thing was a horse, like, like, what, what do I do with that? Like, this is all just a big waste. But then the next day, I can't remember if it was the next day or two days after I had a bunch of guys come to this, to that area from the Alberta Sasquatch organization, which is like my little group of Bigfoot researchers. And we explored the whole area all around the house in the daylight and didn't find any sign of horse at all like it was all just like it's snow so you can you can see where things have walked around there was no horse prints or anything like that of any kind so that was very weird to me and when you listen to the audio like that i recorded there it does it sounds exactly like a horse so that was another weird thing um apparently the neighbors like further down the road were always complaining about like some sort of prowler or something coming into the yard and like rummaging through stuff. That was also very weird. That property that this guy lives on, uh, apparently like a little girl had died there like years back, which is also very strange. So like just all in all, it was a weird spot. And I, I can't explain like the horse thing. A lot of people say Bigfoot can mimic other animals. Right. I don't know if there's any weight to that because it really genuinely does sound like a horse. But the other thing is that there was no horse prints or evidence of a horse being there. Yeah. What left these Bigfoot like tracks? Like there's tracks that look like Sasquatch tracks. And that's the thing. I mean, like if, if you have the, the Sasquatch tracks or tracks that look like Sasquatch, however you want to phrase it, and then you hear the horse, but no horse tracks. And then you remember hearing all the stories of people saying that it mocks their dogs, mimics their, the horses, does some nasty, freaky stuff with horses sometimes. I'm sure you've heard about that. <laughs> uh, I've heard of like them braiding the hair of, of horses. Wow, they get the freak on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so if anybody listening right now has a, a story that you've experienced that with your horses, I, I would genuinely like to talk to you. I will not think you're crazy. I've heard this before and I think it's freaking bizarre but i would definitely want to hear it um so in that in that situation you're left to make conclusions based off of what you've experienced and what you've seen that does point towards sasquatch now if you did you can you can put your opinion out there in a second here as far (laughs) as what i just said uh but if you did film a sasquatch that night with your phone you're, you'd be so, so shaky. You put that online. They're like, he's faking it. It's a man in a suit. Why Why is it so shaky? It, it wouldn't be shaky if he wasn't trying to hide something. Why is it so blurry? I can't see anything. I know it's night, but why can't you turn on the light or something? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many like factors like that. Like, oh, it's just, it's, that's the thing with a lot of the stuff online. That could be the case, right? Like, the people are actually having something crazy happen, but they only managed to get just a little bit of evidence to show you. Yeah. But that's why I have to set it up with saying, like, I have to say, like, I like, I really don't know what's going on here. Like, it's probably nothing. You have to give the whole story and some context as to what's going on. Because to me, the, the sound that this thing made, whatever it was at that time, like it sounds exactly like a horse. I'm like, I can't think of anything like that could really sound that much like a horse. So I'm like, what could it be? But then I did some digging around and, and, and thinking and uh, out in the Nordic area, which is where I do a lot of exploring, um, where, you know, Bigfoot is supposed to reside. There's also a massive population 
of wild horses in the exact area where like all these tree structures are and all these Bigfoot stories have, have taken place. There's wild horses everywhere. So if Bigfoot is going to like mimic any animal, it's probably going to be that one. And I, they exist in such close proximity out there, you know, if Bigfoot is real. So I don't know. It's just, it's all theories. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, all right. I, look at what you just presented as far as evidence goes, what you experienced as evidence. And I'm like, I, I, and maybe, and maybe, and certainly this could be the case that I just lean to more, more towards the idea of Bigfoot to begin with. Right. And so I, I'm I, like, I don't have a, uh, what, what would you say? A, a, a very clear perspective, uh, you know, on, on any of this, but, uh, you went out there looking for horse tracks. You didn't find them and it was snow. So was there like snowing that night that could have covered the horse tracks? And if that's the case that they could have been covered, wouldn't the Bigfoot tracks be covered then too? No, not, like n nothing was covered in snow. Like you can watch the video. You can see what the conditions were like. Well, what was it called it, again? Uh, Supernatural Sasquatch. Okay. Why so, uh, sorry, what were you going to say? <laughs> I was, why did you call it that? Well, because it's just the whole thing seemed supernatural to me. And I say supernatural as kind of like a loose term. Like this could just be uh, stuff we're not really, we don't fully understand as far as science goes. Supernatural, when you say that, it sounds mystical, right? Yeah. But when I think about it a lot, I just think of uh, stuff that exists that we don't have the technology or the ability to perceive what it actually is. It's funny you say that because just a few weeks ago, I was talking about this with uh, the guy that he's the CEO of Randonautica app. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's it's mm. it, it, yeah. it's very interesting. They use a quantum computer in Australia to generate these random locations. And people believe that it, it is supernatural in the sense that it's mystical or it's a giant Ouija board. And uh, him and I talked about it back and forth and stuff. And one thing that we talked about was the idea that, you know, in any groundbreaking science, of any generation, it's usually looked at as like witchcraft or something like that before it's accepted as just a science we didn't understand at that time. And uh, and so I understand where you're coming from. I do lean towards the idea that there could be a supernatural aspect to Bigfoot. Not saying that it there definitely is, but uh, that I've I've heard enough experiences and stories to believe that there could be something going on there. Uh, or maybe we're talking about two separate things and people are, are just trying to camp it all underneath the, the idea of a physical bigfoot that can do magical things uh you know riding unicorns or something i don't know uh it, it's just one of those things i mean they got the horse fetish so maybe they, they like unicorns i don't know uh <laughs> but <laughs> i'm just it's, kidding around it's it's interesting because a lot of people you'll hear who are into bigfoot they they'll always say you need to listen to the indigenous people they know about Bigfoot, like they know it exists. But the people that are saying that are are like flesh and blood people, right? Like they think Bigfoot is just like a physical, like undiscovered thing. But when you go and talk to the indigenous people, they they do believe Bigfoot exists. They have all these like amazing stories and tales. Uh, but to them, it is a supernatural creature. You know, they they believe it to be something that has the ability to maybe disappear and appear like out of thin air. Maybe it has the, the ability to show itself as a different kind of animal or, or whatever, but they do believe it to be like a supernatural being for the most part. Yet these other people who are saying, talk to the indigenous people, they believe it's just a flesh and blood thing. So it's it's like, so what? funny. It's so funny because they, they say that and they're, they're like, you know, they know, they know, they know. And I come back and I report to you what they say. And they're like, well, you know, some of that stuff you got to take with a grain of salt because they're, they're, it's such oral yeah. tradition. And, you know, we know now. And it's just like, hold on a second. You said though, like, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. It's just, but uh, you go, you, you go out and you have these experiences, like the ones I just talked about. And it's like, this really doesn't make sense for this thing to just be an animal or like a person like thing, like a, like a human like thing, just like us there. I, I, it's interesting. You brought up the, like the quantum physics kind of stuff, because it does kind of seem like there's a strange element like that, that we don't understand. And, and people have looked into that, like people like Ron Moorhead, the gentleman who recorded the Sierra sounds. Yeah. He's all about the, the quantum Bigfoot theory and it, 
you know, being something that we just don't understand yet. And it's totally possible. I kind of would develop the theory in my head that Bigfoot could be something that maybe at times it's physical here. It's fully like materialized into this reality, but sometimes it's not. And maybe that's a choice that it has the ability to appear or disappear, or maybe it, 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 by its nature, it naturally exists kind of in like an in-between state where sometimes it's here and sometimes it's not. Maybe right. that's why sometimes you'll have the actual physical creature there caught on film or tracks in the mud and that just disappear. Like it kind of would explain stuff like that, but am I just building a theory based on stuff I can't understand? I, like, I don't know. I, I don't know. What well, it is, I mean, you're taking, you're taking <laughs> things, you're taking things that we do know. I mean, we've seen tracks that just disappear and it doesn't make any sense and stuff. And so when you have that as a fact, you have to build a, an idea, a thought process around it. And unless like, like for me, I look at, it, I'm like, okay, so does it have super strong legs? Like the Hulk and just kind of jumped and landed a hundred yards away and then walked away. Like, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? I mean, there's, there's people that talk about how these things can run and, and jump 20 feet at a time. Well, even 20, 30 feet at a time, you should be able to find tracks 20, 30 feet away then. Like, it, it doesn't make sense on some of this, the, the level of stuff. And, and so I, I do agree with you. And then there's, um, uh, what's uh, Josh Turner over at the Paranormal Roundtable? He talks about the the metaphysical aspect of Dogman, and like he he believes that the longer a Dogman, he he went from believing that Dogman is a physical creature to believing that it's kind of metaphysical, and he he has this idea theory, and I don't know if it's his original or what, but uh, he he's the first one I heard talk about it to me. He, he said that uh, the, he believes the longer that these things are in this dimension, this realm, the more physical they become. And so when people are coming across, let's just say, say, say Dogman, I don't know how you feel about Dogman and stuff, but like say Dogman exists and Bigfoot exists and they both originate in similar origins or similar places. If And that theory is true, then maybe it's a similar thing where we're, we're seeing a physical Bigfoot that can do supernatural things, but the longer they're here, the more physical they become and less supernatural they are. I don't know. It, it, but it's, it takes people like th- us sitting here talking about this stuff openly to, to have any semblance of an idea of what, what's going on here. I, I think for a long time, especially when you and I started doing this around the same time, um, it was very shunned upon to talk like this stuff. And uh, everybody was worried that you're going to be you're, you're be looked at as crazy. And then over time, I think people started like, like me and, and other people coming out and just saying, listen, I don't freaking care. Uh, this is what I think. And uh, we're going to have some fun conversation, see where it goes. And at the end of the day, like I said earlier in this interview, we're not telling you what to believe. Justin, Tony, we're not here telling people what to believe. We're just having conversation back and forth and you take this conversation, walk away and think for yourself and figure out what you believe. That's all it is. There's a lot of things. And like when you start looking into the sciences of like quantum physics and stuff, there's a lot of things like nowadays that are generally like more and more accepted, like the idea of like parallel universes and and things like that. I, I, th- I think it's more accepted nowadays that, that those... Yeah. So if you think about a parallel reality or universe, there has to be things um, like objects and beings that exist there. So there could be literally anything that exists in an alternate reality. We don't really know. And maybe something exists like just off of this reality, like just a few frequencies off. Like, I I don't know, like this is all theory, right? Everything exists at a frequency. Yeah. And the stuff we can see and feel, it's all frequencies and vibrations. Maybe something exists kind of just off, but sometimes it's just like, it can be here. I agree, man. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I have a hard time. I have a hard time like trying to get my thoughts across with words. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, 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 I'm the same way. I, I just ramble on until I get it. Uh, so like parallel universes, 100%. Okay. Um, Edward Monet, he said it on the Chelsea Handler show. I talk about this all the time. Like when you have a, a, a physicist like him saying, actually, we do d- dabble in parallel universes. And he and he said, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, stranger things where they're going into the upside down and stuff, which I don't believe. Okay. And I have reserved the right not to believe that. Uh, but the fact is, 
we have a mainstream scientist saying we do dabble in parallel universes. So just that alone says, yes, parallel universes do exist and there are things in there to dabble in. And then when you take it to more of my level of things and where I come from on things and the way I look at, I, I'll look at everything and I'll take pieces of this and be like, this is similar to this over here. I know you say they're two different topics, but I don't think they might necessarily be two different topics. So schools of mystery do exist. There are schools of mystery that are not publicized. They don't have a website where you can enroll, uh, but they do exist. And I've talked to people who have talked to people that were in these schools of mysteries talking about what they're taught and what they've seen. And one of the things, the first thing I heard him talk about was how this, uh, I guess, what do you call it? A wizard, a witch, whatever this person was that in training at the school of mystery, they were being taught how to open portals. Well, what do you have? What is a portal? It, it, it's a doorway to another side of something, you know, and, and they were learning how to open portals. And she said that she had seen things come through these portals. And one, and, and, and one of the things that she says she saw come through the portal was an upright walking dog. And I heard this on my way to Kentucky to go hunt the dog, man. I'm like, freak, man. <laughs> I'm like, wow. yo. Uh, but I mean, so that's where I'm. Uh, what I mean by I take 10 different things and I kind of combine stuff because I think that there's truth in the middle of everything. And so when I have yeah. Edward Monet saying we do dabble in parallel universes, and then I have schools of mystery uh, teaching their students how to open portals for those parallel universes. And they say, this is what comes through. And how many times do we hear people talk about portals? whether they're opening them or coming across them out in the wilderness somewhere. Have you seen a portal, by the way? No, I don't think so. <laughs> bummer, bummer. Maybe you walk through one and that's how we're talking. We're on the other side of it. Dude, it's possible. Every day, like I wake up and I see what's going on and like on the news, I feel like every day I, I like slip into a different reality. Dude. It just it yeah. keeps, it keeps getting so weird. Bro, <laughs> that 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 process started 2001, bro. It's like <laughs> the world will never be the same after 9/11. It affected everything and from there it all just went <laughs> You know, it went downhill. I, I have the theory that the world actually did end as we know it in 2012 because that's exactly when Instagram blew up. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I'm <laughs> you're right. Uh I'm I mm, man, I've been this has happened to me a lot recently. I've been doing interviews where I I listen, I came across something recently that relays into so much that I cover on the show and until I'm ready to talk about it publicly and stuff, I I have to do it in codes. But I yes. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well as far as like the alternate reality thing parallel universe thing goes i like to dumb it down to understand it for myself as if like there, you can have certain cameras that can take pictures and videos of different light frequencies that we can't visibly see you can see stuff on there you don't see it like that but that's actually there you know what i mean like there could be stuff around you that you can't see with your like organic eyes like human eyes but other things can see it, which is very strange to think about. Like you can have a camera set to record just ultraviolet light or whatever, and it looks really weird, but you don't see it like that. It's very strange to think of it yeah. in that sense. You know, I, I had a similar experience happen uh, just recently at the house. I've talked about it on the show a couple of times where uh, my dad and I just got done recording uh, for our other podcast, Hammerlane Legends. Shout out to Hammerlane Legends. And um, we go out my basement door to walk around the house because I had a bunch of uh, trash in the backyard from cleaning out my basement. And we come down around the hill to the back of the house to get some more trash bags. And I see this bright light in the sky. And he sees the bright light too. So it's our naked eye. We see this. But we don't see the same thing. So I saw this, this light with in the sky with streaks of light coming down off the side, like almost in an arcing manner, uh, almost like it, almost as if it had wings of some kind, you know, even though I don't think that's what it was. Uh, my dad couldn't see those streaks of light whatsoever. I went in the house, got the camera I'm talking to you on right now, the Sony a7 III, took pictures of it. Now, I'm sure you understand that this camera takes great night footage. I mean, it like d dimly lit, very good. Took a picture of this thing. The light's there. There's no streaks coming off of it. I look up, I can see the streaks on the camera. No, my dad, no. And it's it's really interesting. And people have said, suggested that I have a problem with my eyes and stuff. I, and I and I I would just say I don't think I, I don't think I do. I mean, 
I go to the eye doctor every year and the last couple of years, he's been telling me my, my eyes actually haven't been, been improving. Like they're actually getting better. And so I, I didn't know that was possible, but apparently it is. And uh, so I don't know what that was, but it's very interesting the way we perceive things versus what is really going on there. I don't know if those streaks of light were just my perception or, or what, but I could see something my dad couldn't see or the camera. So I'm assuming it, I'm just going crazy, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird when you think when you think about that kind of stuff and then think about the the world of Bigfoot. Like maybe one person will see the creature and maybe other people will see something totally different. Maybe they'll yeah. see a bear standing up. I, I don't know. But it's like people do perceive things differently and people are more susceptible to be fooled than other people. So it's like, man, it's just it's hard to navigate that world and to yeah. come up with any solid I guess, uh, any solid conclusions on what is going on? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, it, it, it's hard, but it's also fun if you're willing to just kind of take it on the chin whenever you say something that people don't agree with. And so, uh, <laughs> just kind of just do it. Um, I've gotten used to that over the years. What I haven't gotten used to, like you said, you, you kind of gotten better at is the YouTube negativity. I'm like, yo, <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to clap back every time. But I'm just like, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for, <laughs> for this. Not usually, it usually self-regulates in the comment section. People I, will, so people, people will rush in to defend you, uh, which gotcha. is great. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I don't look at the comments enough to, to see the defense and stuff. And usually when I see a negative comments, cause I just posted the video and I'm just like, bang, let's kill them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a brave thing to do is to venture into the comments of your own videos. Yeah. You know, if you want to take an emotional beating, then go for it. <laughs> right. Right. Because I mean, you put all this time and effort in something you're like, this sucks. <laughs> it's like, then yep. you do better. You do better. <laughs> <laughs> Show me how it's done. You know? So. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you get a flogging every time you go down in there. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you, uh, I brought it up a little bit here. Uh, thoughts on other cryptids and stuff. I mean, you're into Bigfoot. Do you ever venture into other ideas and stuff? Or do you think Bigfoot's the only cryptid in the world that's possible? Well, no, like, I mean, you could look immediately, uh, an immediate cousin of Bigfoot. You can look at all the the Yeti encounters and the Yowie in Australia and all those other like upright cryptids. I'm very interested in those, obviously. Um, don't, but, don't don't cheat this question, okay? I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm I not asking about Yowie and Yeti. <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious about a lot of the sea creatures like the Ogopogo and Cadborosaurus in British Columbia. Um, I think most of the Nessie stuff that comes out is probably not real. I, I have a hard time believing that that one creature could could be kicking around for all this time, you know. <laughs> but yeah. I, I'm I'm actually very very interested in like UFOs and uh, aliens and that kind of stuff like very interested to the point where i i don't know if i want to taint my love for that subject by making content about it i'm kind of keeping that for myself keeping to enjoy it keeping it yeah pure. <laughs> exactly but man like with the ufo stuff i've like i've seen stuff in the sky that i can't explain it to be anything else so that's the difference i guess between me or between the Bigfoot stuff and like the UFO stuff is with the UFO stuff. I've seen stuff where I'm like, this is 100% real. Like I, I, I'm pretty firm on that, but with the Bigfoot stuff, it's more of a mystery and it allows me to go out and explore and, and try and find answers. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it, you mentioned about the, like the sea creatures and things like that. Uh, if you came across like a big lake out there while you're hunting for Bigfoot and you know, you come across a giant lake and you see a serpent that's 30 feet long, just going through the water. And it has like, you know, a forked tongue and two heads or whatever. Like, I mean, it's clearly not an eel. It's definitely something bizarre. Uh, would you film it and would you release it? Or because it's not on the, 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 the agenda of hunting Bigfoot, you would let that fall to the side and not release that kind of stuff. I'd probably just give up right there. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm packing it up and, and leaving. I can't get what I want on video. Right. I try to film Bigfoot and I end up getting a sea monster. Right. No, I, I would definitely, if I saw it, obviously I'd film it, but it's like, I, I was what do you do with that? Like you release it and let the people tell you you faked it. <laughs> 
I, I mean, I was talking recently to uh, somebody who's done TV shows on this kind of stuff. And uh, he told me, I was, I was talking to him about an area that I was planning on going to. And uh, he told me in that area, they came across a a big lake pond or whatever. And they saw just that, like a 25 foot, like some kind of creature, you know, it, it was like huge and it, it was fresh water. And, uh, and I'm like, why didn't that make the show? And he's like, because it wasn't on the agenda. And I'm just like, dang, dude, I'm staying independent. Like, I'm not letting no TV <laughs> producer say, well, we're not out here looking for dragons and we, you know, we can't put it on. What are you talking about, bro? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, film it and save it for a different production. I, it's, I it's, it's, it was probably filmed and lost in these archives. And I think every like seven years, 10 years, these these production companies delete their archives and I, it's just going to get deleted with time. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> It's interesting to th- to talk about the the sea creature stuff because um, this one time one uh, a, a guy I know he's like an older First Nations guy he was telling us this story of this almost alligator like like water creature that was spotted however many times up in like the Northwest Territories in Canada and it had like scales on he's telling us this story they believe there's some sort of like creature in the water that has it's almost like a mythical thing like bigfoot and i'm i'm thinking about it while he's telling the story and i'm like this guy is definitely talking about a sturgeon okay. it just the way he described it it was exactly like a sturgeon it was massive long had like almost like scales on it looked like a crocodile if you look at a sturgeon i mean it's kind of like that and it's absolutely massive prehistoric fish wow and and so do you think that's what he was looking at probably but i didn't say anything i just let him tell the story i didn't want to interfere with his beliefs <laughs> well you, you should have asked him you should have been like well, well i mean if he's in that area i mean he's sure he knows what they look like he's like have you ever thought it could be a sturgeon uh no no here's why or well this? people don't want to believe that it's a sturgeon though. it doesn't it's not matter fun. though it, it doesn't matter <laughs> like like you just that that's what i like about doing this is that you just present inquisitive questions and and like i don't care what your answer is but let's just talk and see where it goes yeah well, that's the thing though a lot of people don't want it to be anything else yeah they I guess just so. really deeply want it to be something exciting and i don't know why if it's just because day-to-day life is so boring and i'm sure that's part it's of funner it. when it's something fantastic right like you want to live yeah. in a fantasy world <laughs> that's true that's true i mean it it you you see stuff on TV, you hear other people's stories and you're like, man, I wish I could have seen that. And so, you know, like I was talking about earlier and stuff. I mean, I think that there are times that people have a radical experience that they actually had. And from that experience, they go on this like life journey of hunting that experience again. And they tend to over time water it down because they're not replicating what they first had. And they're like, it's like you're looking for that next hit. And eventually you're like, okay, this freaking, this tree's close enough. Yep, that's it. That's what it is, you know. <laughs> and so you yeah. get that, that that hit again. Uh, and I don't think they do it consciously, but I think subconsciously, it's just one of those things that happen and stuff. Uh, and so you know, it is what it is. All right, I know you got to get rolling here and stuff, but I got to ask you two more questions. Uh, the farmer, did he that he brought, that brought you out? Did he actually see these creatures? Uh, apparently, okay. He wasn't a farmer though. I'll okay. say that he was just a, he lived out in the country. Gotcha. Um, he worked elsewhere. Um, he claimed that he actually had seen one probably like 15 yards or so from where we were measuring the tracks. And like, I, I stood in the exact spot and I, I filmed it's in the video. Like you can see the exact spot where he said he, he had seen it. So he said he saw it kind of crouching down in these bushes, watching him. And just to like be at that location, right at like ground zero looking at that spot and just imagining it it was creepy man i'm sure like that whole experience was just creepy and had weird vibes um but i didn't see anything physical all all i got was like tracks and i heard stuff heard something big crashing through the bushes and i saw the tracks and i heard maybe something creeping around in the trees when we were being really quiet so it was stuff like that and like all the pine cones that were thrown at his house was also a weird little detail absolutely uh all right well that, that's interesting i wasn't sure if he actually saw him or not and stuff uh but the fact that he says he saw him and stuff kind of i mean i don't know take it or leave it as it as he, it is 
Yeah, he said he saw them. And like when I first showed up there, he said there was two of them. I don't know how he determined there was two of them. If he actually saw two of them at one point or if he just heard them in two different spots. I have no idea. Or it could be one teleporting back and forth. You never freaking know. See, something I should have done, like when you're when you're going out and investigating these things, you forget to do so many different things because your mind is racing. Yes. But one of the things I should have done was got him to maybe do a sketch of what he saw and just to see like if he would struggle with that, you know, and kind of like That's maybe I could idea. pick up on him like making stuff up, you know. Yeah, I don't know. And he had, I didn't get the sense that he made up the tracks and fabricated those. Like I'm like, I, I didn't see anything that would lead me to believe that the tracks going through his yard were made by him. They were so far apart and they were so big that it's like, I don't know. And they came from like somewhere else far away. Like those tracks, that trackway came from somebody else's property across the road, like a gravel road into his yard and through <laughs> like the ravine. How far, did you tra- how far did you follow those tracks until you couldn't follow them anymore? Or how'd, how'd you go about that? Well, we f- pretty much followed them down into the ravine. There's like a creek down there. And uh, we did a bunch of exploring down there, but we didn't cross. There's other proper, like people's land back there. We didn't cross into their land. So, Oh, you guys following rules. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. One more question here. And this is a question because I really don't know. Do you go alone on these trips at all? Or do you have a team of guys that go with you? I mostly go alone. Amazing. And like, well, nowadays, like I I do like to go with a person just because like it does get boring being out in the woods for so long by yourself that it's like, man, it would really be nice to have some company or someone to just like talk to. (laughs) Right. But like I, I've, trekked out like 25 kilometers into the middle of nowhere by myself and camped out in a little tent like what i do to get by usually is i'll like download a bunch of podcasts beforehand about bigfoot and creepy stuff to kind of get in the zone and i'll be i will have those things on throughout the night just to have something to get my mind off of like other stuff like just to kind of distract myself but for some reason I, i tend to always choose the creepy stuff to listen to and yeah, I don't know. It's sometimes it's hard to coordinate with other people to get out into the bush for so long. Yeah. You kind of are forced to go by yourself. And, you know, it's kind of nice when you're filming to be by yourself because you don't have to worry about people judging you. <laughs> it's kind of like embarrassing to film yourself out in public, you know, and around people. Right. <laughs> I know. I, I think about that too, because I, I would like to start a vlog and stuff and like a vlog channel. And I'm just like, it's weird though. Like I don't like it's weird just walking around filming myself for the house. It, like I don't want to do that out. Like the people that walking through the grocery store talking to the camera. It's like get a life, you know. Like <laughs> it's like dude, I I don't know how those people go out into the city streets and film like that. I like I I am a person like in my day to day life. I hate attention. Like when right. I'm outside doing stuff, I'm just like keep to myself, and I I can't stand it. <laughs> Those people are crazy. Yes, that that's exactly the way. I just want to get in, get out. Don't, I I don't I don't want to talk to people and all that stuff. And so like doing that would draw attention, obviously. And I'm just like leave me alone, you know, because I don't want somebody asking me what I'm doing and all. That. Just you know, mm-hmm. so I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't be a good vlogger, but uh, <laughs> you know, maybe I'll just keep it at my house. You know, I don't know. But uh, it's really interesting, man. Having a good conversation with you. Uh, before we get out of here, let people know again who you are, where they can find your stuff, and e- any kind of social media you want to shout out as well. Yeah. Well, I'm Justin Chernapesky, if you're wondering how to pronounce it. Well, that's why I said tell and- <laughs> who you are, because I'm like, I'm not going to try again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I have a YouTube channel called Mountain Beast Mysteries. 107,000 it- subscribers. 107,000. Yes. yes. It took a while to get there, but we primarily focus on Bigfoot every now and then we'll talk about something else. Maybe like when we first started out, we talked about ghosts and UFOs and Bigfoot, but Bigfoot took over. That's mostly what it's about. So if you're into Bigfoot, definitely check it out, subscribe. And uh, that's the best place to follow. There's also a Mountain Beast Mysteries Facebook page that you can follow as well. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on and uh, chatting with me, having a conversation. I think this was probably long overdue, man. Like, I don't know. I I have no idea why we didn't connect sooner. I, it, literally yeah, we haven't even like talked at all like no like- <laughs> i mean like we, we've known each, we've known of each other and we've talked very sparingly over the years and i i don't i really don't remember what it was but i was just like like something made me think i, I remember i was doing something with my stuff and it made me think about you and i'm like 
his name was Justin something. And I was just like, <laughs> I, I looked around online and stuff. And I think I looked at my friends and just looked through all the Justins until I found you. And I was like, dude, let's talk. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. It, it's awesome, man. And uh, congratulations on the success you've been having and stuff. And uh, I really Thank appreciate you. you chatting with me and having a fun conversation. Yeah, man. That was awesome. I'm glad we could finally get into all this weird stuff. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it, because that's the best thing you can do to help the show grow. And just a reminder, if you want to see Expedition Dogman right now, it's only available on Merkle.media. That's www.merkle.media. If you want to see the early release, the VIP release of Expedition Dogman, every dime we earn from these VIP passes goes right into the next documentary, the travel expenses, the lodging, all the stuff that goes into it that's what you're helping to support the future projects of legion of legends documentaries thank you very much friends for that support you guys have been very gracious and once again if you want to get in on that action early merkel.media is the place to go for expedition dogman and if you don't that's fine on youtube the confessionals youtube channel on march 25th at 9 p.m eastern standard time we are going to release expedition dogman to the public so if you don't want to help support the cause that's fine you can wait until we release it on youtube but that said, friends, thanks a lot for the support. And once again, I want to remind you, check out Freaky Deaky Podcast. They are great friends of the show, and I would love for you guys to go and support them as well. So go ahead, give them a subscribe, a five-star rating review, and then hit play. All right, guys, until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Awakened from the forest in the depths of the abyss. This creature is a paradigm of time lost and time itself. It fears no one. It adheres to no rule that man can create. It forges its own path and yet its path remains hidden from the world. The sphere of its existence is beyond most comprehension as it exudes its power quietly but transcendent. It needs no one's approval to exist, but yet its very existence is sought after by many. It watches. It learns. Adapts to the ever-changing environment around it, even as the environment is wrought with corruption. It battles the corruption only when pressed or for the protection of others like it. It is a mirage that few will ever understand. It's a cornucopia of knowledge from an era long past. It's free. It's Bigfoot. My fantasies always consisted of making it big. My soul was nothing more than a bargaining chip. Marketing is what they tell you to do and what you're willing to give. LARPing to the fullest extent. I don't wait, I shoot first like Han on a rodeo. And these people don't understand me like reading a Nokia and stretch thin. Like pulling an accordion, my heart ain't primordium. All these historians telling us lies, setting aside. Everything is medicalized. Politicians selling the ride. I better me die where the relevance lies. They're dressing alike, reptilians. My resilience is brilliant. I'm here to lead the rebellion on hellion. Salient, alien with no melody.